All right, good morning, uh, good afternoon, rather. A uh, couple of uh, organizational notes. Just as a reminder, uh, please mute your microphones. If you have any questions, put them in the text box um, next to you, the video, and Florencia will relay them to me. Um, I am in touch with our technical colleagues who've been uh, from TV and from BCSS who've been doing an amazing job keeping us uh, keeping us live um, to see if we can move to a format uh, where I can take live uh, audio questions. But that will require a, a lot of discipline from your on your end to make sure all the microphones are muted. Anyway, uh, we will try to do that uh, the next time we have a briefing. Uh, so starting up with the news, ahead of the virtual meeting of the G20 leaders this week, the Secretary General has written to leaders a letter in which he calls for concerted and decisive action on the current global health crisis uh, spread human, that spreads human suffering and upends the global economy. The Secretary General called for a, quote, wartime plan urging G20 leaders to step forward with a strong response package to address the various threats posed by the COVID-19 virus to demonstrate solidarity with the world's people, especially the world's most vulnerable. <clears throat> the Secretary General called on the G20 to address three critical areas. First, he stressed the need for coordination and cooperation to suppress the virus. Second, he said we must minimize the social and economic impact of COVID-19 and stimulate a faster recovery everywhere. Lastly, he underscored that we must reaffirm our common responsibility to recover better with more inclusive and sustainable models of development. This crisis, he said, is a stark reminder of humanity's common fate and the need for upfront investments to reduce the catastrophic downstream risks of the pandemic. And you saw yesterday the Secretary General spoke to you and he called for an immediate global ceasefire in all corners of the world in the face of the common COVID-19 enemy. The virus, he said, does not care about nationality or ethnicity, faction or faith. The most vulnerable, women and children, people with disabilities, the marginalized and the displaced are also at higher risk of suffering devastating losses from COVID-19. The Secretary General noted in, a war, in war-ravaged countries, health system have collapsed. The fury of the virus illustrates the folly of war, he added, adding that it is time to put armed conflict on lockdown, focus together on the true fight. Tomorrow at 10 a.m., the Secretary General uh, will launch the COVID-19 Global Humanitarian Response Plan, which aims to provide assistance to save lives in the most vulnerable countries while containing the outbreak globally. This, as uh, you can now expect, will be a virtual event that you'll be able to watch uh, right here on the UN Web TV and other channels. The Secretary General will also be joined virtually by Mark Lowcock, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Dr. Tedros, the Director General of WHO, and Henrietta Four, UNICEF's Executive Director. <clears throat> We will make the opening remarks as, uh, and other background material uh, as well as the response plan. Uh, we'll share that with you under embargo later today. Uh, you will then be able to submit uh, questions in writing beforehand, uh, which we will then submit uh, to the four participants uh, as they speak to you uh, live tomorrow. And, uh, that those questions will be need it will need to be submitted before 9 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, but all the details will be in the email we will send out to you. Turning to COVID and human rights uh, from Geneva, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, today said that the broad selector that broad uh, sectoral sanctions would urgently need to be reevaluated in countries facing the COVID-19 pandemic. These sanctions would have a potentially debilitating impact on the health sector and human rights, she said. She added that in a context of global pandemic, impending medical efforts in one country heightens the risk for all of us, calling for humanitarian exemptions to sanctions measures. For his part, the Secretary General fully backs the High Commissioner's sentiments. He has been in touch with a number of member states, including those who have imposed sanctions. 
Regarding Iran, the Secretary General received a call from Foreign Minister Javad Zarif earlier this week to discuss the matter. The Secretary General is very much aware of the shortage of medicine and medical equipment in Iran that makes it much more difficult to contain the outbreak. He appeals on all member states and all members of the international community to facilitate and support Iran's efforts at this critical time. Uh, and as the COVID-19 pandemic evolves, the World Food Program is also is looking to pre-position buffer stocks of food or cash to provide at least three months of food assistance to vulnerable people in priority countries. The agency's main focus is to ensure that the resources in place to address the food and nutrition needs of 87 million people it plans to assist in 2020. The World Food Program appealed to government partners uh, an estimated $1.9 billion, um, excuse me, WFP appealed to government partners to approve an estimated $1.9 billion of contributions to the agency's food assistance program. They're also asking for maximum flexibility in the way that resources are used, allowing for dynamic response to the changing outlook. As an example of the agency's support, the spokesperson for WFP explained how they deployed a team of supply chain experts to World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva and Iran and provided a two-month supply of personal protection equipment for more than 2,000 staff and volunteers from the Iranian Red Crescent Society. And turning to Kenya, the UN team le there led by the World Health Organization has been working closely with the government in response to the outbreak. WHO experts have been integrated in the National COVID-19 Technical and Coordination Committee since Jan mid-January. More than 20 UN staff members uh, have been seconded to government teams, including in the area of communications to help disseminate prevention messages at the national and local level. UNICEF and other UN entities are also helping the government on emergency procurement, while WHO is sourcing lab kits to increase the stocks. And the UN resident coordinator has also set up an interagency team with the government, the European Union, the World Bank, and other partners to support the government with analysis of the impacts of COVID-19. Turning to the DRC, the cases of COVID now confirmed in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the UN peacekeeping mission and the humanitarian community are mobilizing the support of the government's response in a context with a fragile, in a context with a fragile health infrastructure. The UN humanitarian coordinator, David McClon Carr, um, said efforts undertaken today to prevent the spread of the virus must apply throughout the national territory to help avoid a major health crisis. People in the DRC continue to face one of the most complex humanitarian crises in the world and could further endanger the lives of millions of Congolese who are already at particular risk. Also this morning, the Security Council members are hearing updates by, the, uh, by VTC from the UN peacekeeping mission in the DRC and spe Special Representative Zerugi, as well as Under Secretary General Jean-Pierre Lacroix, and that is being done virtually. Um, and from South Sudan, the UN peacekeeping mission in the country has put in place a seven-day freeze on staff traveling into the country as part of efforts to, spread, to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Cargo flights into the country will continue rotations of military peacekeepers, were stopped on March 4th, well before the onset of the pandemic, and all upcoming rotations have been put on hold. The UN mission is committed to maintaining its activities to protect civilians and to build durable peace efforts to the best ability given the challenges posed by the COVID-19. And just to flag something on behalf of the President of the General Assembly, in a letter sent to member states, the President of the General Assembly presented a proposal for how the General Assembly can take essential decisions related to the organization while dealing with the pandemic. He submitted a draft decision that would enable the General Assembly to adopt essential decisions under a silence procedure. If a preliminary meeting of the General Assembly is not practicable due to the pandemic, the proposal would authorize the president of the GA to circulate after consultation with the General Committee draft decisions of the Assembly to all member states under a silence procedure at least 72 hours. If the silence is not broken, the decision shall be considered adopted. The draft decision is itself under silence procedures until noon on Friday. And the UN Economic Commission for Europe is launching an observatory on border crossing status due to COVID-19. 
which will gather all, uh, gather all updated information regarding border crossings, limitations worldwide. The aim is to facilitate the work of transport operators and preserve their connectivity by keeping supply chains open as much as possible. And the Special Envoy for Syria, Gary Peterson, today followed the Secretary General's appeal for an immediate ceasefire around the world by calling on a complete, immediate nationwide ceasefire throughout Syria to enable an all-out efforts to suppress the COVID-19. He said Syrians were acutely vulnerable to the virus with the healthcare facilities having been destroyed or degraded as a shortage of key medical equipment and health uh, professionals. To confront the danger, he said the long-suffering Syrian people desperately need a sustained period of calm throughout the country, respected by all parties. Mr. Patterson also appealed on humanitarian grounds for large-scale release of detainees and abductees. Uh, the full statement has been uh, shared with you uh, earlier today. And turning to Chad, the in a report, uh, the, the Humanitarian Response Plan was published today for the one for 2020, which seeks $545 million, a little more, over 69 million more dollars than last year to help 3 million of the most vulnerable people in the country. Continued conflict in neighborhood countries and increased insecurity due to non-state armed groups activities in the Lake Chad area have displaced over 650,000 people on the Chadian territory. Thousands of people have been displaced multiple times for over a decade with little response to return, with little prospect to return home in the near future. Malnutrition levels are also concerning with rates of severe malnutrition at 2.9% above the emergency threshold. Two senior appointments to tell you about today. Uh, We are, Secretary General is appointing Deborah Lyons of Canada as the new special representative and head of the UN assistance mission for Afghanistan. Ms. Lyons succeeds Tadamichi Yamamoto of Japan, who served in this critical role since 2016. The Secretary General is grateful for Mr. Yamamoto's important contributions and service to the UN mission since taking his role as Deputy Special Representative in 2014 and then as Special Representative. Ms. Lyons is a diplomat of 21 years of professional experience and international uh, economic development. Most recently, she served as Ambassador of Canada to Israel and from 2013-2016, Ambassador to the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Uh, we are, Secretary General is also appointing Guang Kong of uh, the People's Republic of China as his new Deputy Special Representative of Political Affairs for South Sudan and Deputy Head of the UN Mission. Mr. Kong succeeds Mustafa Sumar of Mali, to whom the Secretary General is grateful for his distinguished service uh, in South Sudan. Mr. Kong brings vast experience of international affairs to the position, including service with several UN peace operations. And lastly, today is World TB, Tuberculosis Day. The World Health Organization today issued recommendations that will help countries accelerate efforts to stop people infected with tuberculosis from becoming sick with TB and by giving them preventive treatment. A quarter of the world's population is estimated to be infected with TB bacteria. And there's a message from Dr. Tedros on this. So at this point, I will look to your questions. And uh, we will see what we can uh, answer. Um, Stand by one second. Well, obviously, Pam asks if world leaders have uh, responded to the SG's call for a ceasefire. Uh, The Secretary General Special Envoy, his representatives on the ground, as Mr. Pedersen will be d- doing, and as Mr. Um, uh, Griffiths had already done in Yemen, will be uh, putting out that message uh, to all the parties uh, involved. And we very much hope uh, that results will be seen, which in, for what is really a, a very basic and obvious call uh, for, uh, for a ceasefire. Um, Kyoto, uh, Japanese government international committee agreed to postpone the Summer Olympics for about a year. Um, you know, I, I think it, this is a decision uh, having been made by the IOC and the Japanese government, uh, not one that involves the Secretary General, but it seems to us a very wise uh, decision to take in light of the, the pandemic and the need for continued 
uh, social distancing in order to break the curve. Uh, Maria, yesterday we received information that there are no Security Council meetings. At the same time, there's one which in, there is uh, one which is informal uh, consultations. Under these circumstances, I, um, I think it is best for you to contact the presidency of the Security Council to get the exact description of what under what uh, format they are actually uh, meeting and what outcome. Uh, you will expect uh, for them. Um, there are obviously discussions within member, members of the Security Council, and I think the Council can best speak uh, for its uh, for itself. Um, uh, Pam, uh, I think we've had a statement on uh, on Afghanistan following the elections on the current situation, and I would refer you. Uh, I would refer you to uh, to that. Um, from ED, the Secretary General is making very ambitious requests to the G20 leaders that he speak to any of them uh, before sending the letter to gauge reactions. Uh, when is the virtual uh, the G20 meeting? My understanding is taking place early Thursday morning, early Thursday morning, uh, New York time. Uh, the Secretary General will participate by video conference. I think, as every all the other leaders will take, we hope to share with you a bit of the remarks the Secretary General will deliver. Yes, uh, it is the 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 request is indeed uh, is indeed very bold. Uh, but I think, as the Secretary General makes clear, um, it is some. If there is one event in which we need international solidarity, it is this. Um, Unless the virus is stamped out everywhere, none of us uh, will be uh, will be safe. It is critical uh, that the financial uh, packages being being put out do not just address the liquidity issue, but also address how to build more inclusive and more sustainable economies, how to keep uh, people and small businesses afloat. These are very ambitious uh, asks, but we know the the will needs to be there. The resources. Uh, are there. It is a matter of the international community coming together to beat uh, to beat a virus which knows no border. You know, for, for we very often talk about climate change and pandemics that know no borders. This is such a, a clear illustration of a problem that needs international solidarity and international uh, cooperation. Um, Iftikhar, no, I have no, uh, we've seen the press reports on the U.S. action uh, to cut $1 billion in aid. I have no, uh, no comment at this point. We'll have to look, uh, look into it. Um, on the NPT, uh, I believe it was postponed, uh, but I do have to check again. Uh, James asks on Iran after his call, Farn Zir, does the SG plan to speak with the U.S. Uh, administration? Um, the Secretary General, as I said, has had contacts uh, with various uh, countries that have imposed sanctions, including uh, the United States. And I think the message that he is saying publicly is also the message he is addressing uh, privately uh, to those uh, countries. Um, how many swipes in the building? As uh, Dulcie, I will tell you uh, in about uh, two seconds. Um, if you bear with me, uh, there were very few, uh, there were very few swipes and I will tell you in a second, if you don't mind, uh, Sorry, excuse me. Uh, uh, all right, the, the swipes today, uh, as of 11 o'clock, uh, was about 130. Um, and that is down from uh, 11,000 uh the last day that we had at the UN uh without any um without any any restrictions 
Um, the Secretary General is reducing his time uh, in the building. He's working partly from home and partly, uh, partly from, uh, from the building. Um, the UN is following uh, the restrictions uh, put in place by New York State. All non-essential personnel are tasked to work uh, from home. There are obviously some essential personnel uh, that need to stay in the building, notably those technicians who enab enable us uh, to have these uh, briefings or these virtual uh, press uh, conferences. Uh, the, latest, um, the latest numbers of UN staff uh, throughout the system that have are confirmed is uh, 51. Uh, that's the latest number as of, uh, as of today. Uh, I do not have an update on David Beasley, but last we heard he was doing uh, well and working from his home in uh, South Carolina. I know of no other UN, uh, UN uh, senior official boss who has agency head who has the virus. Uh, Abdel Hamid asked if Tunisia called for a special meeting of the council. You would have to ask the council presidency. Um, uh, James asks if Secretary, please stress the Security Council members the need for their meetings to be public and webcast, and are there technical arrangements made for virtual stakeout? We will be taking the lead from uh, the Security Council. Obviously, I think all of us would want as greatest transparency, the same transparency you have uh, when we're in the building to be replicated as best possible uh, in, a virtual, uh, in a virtual world. Um, I think that's um, it, unless I get another question. Perfect. Uh, we will see all. So just as a reminder, the Secretary General will do the launch uh, tomorrow uh, of the, the humanitarian, which means we will not have a noon briefing. We'll have another noon briefing at noon on Thursday. By then, we hope to have addressed the issues of uh, getting direct questions from you. Uh, Dulce says, Council Presidency, they're not communicating. Uh, you have, there's no alternative to go, than to go to the, council, the Presidency of the UN Security Council. Uh, we are not able to, uh, uh, we are not able to, uh, to speak on their, uh, uh, their behalf. Uh, Oscar, I think I answered the question about the ceasefire. And Yoshita, I think every, it's important that every country uh, take whatever precautions uh, they need in order to uh, not only bend, but break uh, the curve. Thank you all, and see you uh, Thursday.